Okay, we are almost Excellent. ready. Okay. Good afternoon, Professor Bishop. My name is Raffaella. I work for Fondazione Golinelli. Olivia already introduced you, but I just want to say a few words. We know that you, are, you have a degree in philosophy, maths, uh, sociology. So I think we, we think that you are the best person who can just talk about future and complexity. And I don't want to just take your time. And so I leave you to our uh, guests. And uh, thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. It's just a pleasure to uh, always be with you. I love talking to educators, uh, being one myself, and because we have a very important job, and that is to prepare our students and indeed our children uh, for the future. It's one of the missions of education that people talk about. Why do we educate students? Well, so they can be uh, productive and happy and, and, and successful adults. Uh, and we tell them a lot of things. We teach them a lot of things to do that. We teach them to read and to write. Uh, we teach them to calculate. and We teach them about many of the things, particularly in science, as you folks do, and in, uh, in, in history. We teach a lot about the past. One thing we don't teach them, however, is about the future. And of course, there's a lot of good reasons why we don't teach them about the future. Uh, first of all, are we gonna put the, uh, the slide up uh, on the screen or not? Should, is that gonna happen? Oh, I didn't share my screen, my mistake, sorry. Um, I have to share my screen first for you to do that. There we go. So the purpose of education is preparing students for the future and our uh, job is a big one and we teach them lots of different things but one thing we don't teach them is about the future itself. Uh, there's a lot of, as I said, a lot of good reasons why we don't do so. First of all, nobody ever taught us about the future when we were students or even as professors. And so it's very difficult for us to teach something that we don't know. Uh, other people might object is that you can't teach the future because it hasn't happened yet. And of course, that's an interesting uh, philosophical problem. Can you teach people things that don't exist? Um, about things that don't exist. Well, I like to point out that though we believe that the past did exist at one time, uh, frankly, the past does not exist anymore. So we're teaching uh, inferences, we're teaching conclusions about things which we cannot directly observe in the past. So why couldn't we teach the inferences, conclusions about things that we could not, uh, we cannot yet observe about the future? So there's a second reason why we can't do it, because we don't believe that it's possible to teach, but we teach about the past. And uh, finally, uh, it is important to know that I and many other professors around the world have been teaching about the future for a very long time. The University of Houston began its Master of Science program in Studies of the Future in 1975, which was more than 40 years ago. I took over that program in the early 1980s and have ran it for about 30 years, developed the curriculum and many other aspects of the program. So we know, and there are now a half a dozen other, or at least a half a dozen, maybe a dozen other graduate programs around the world that uh, are teaching the future and doing it very well. We have over 500 members in the Association of Professional Futurists and more, over 200 members in the World Future Studies Federation. So this field is becoming solid, substantial, recognized, and indeed, I believe we can teach about the future in a rigorous way. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so delighted to be able to share this with you. I retired from the university, as you probably said, um, a, few, a few years ago, uh, 2013. And I realized that I had been speaking to adults the whole life, my whole life. I had not been, uh, and uh, I realized that uh, people have not been speaking to young students, to uh, secondary students, and to undergraduates in the college, or even elementary students. And so I founded this organization called Teach the Future, 
whose mission is to encourage and to support teachers and administrators who would like to introduce futures thinking into their classes. Uh, if you're interested, this um, uh, URL has the presentation, and I'll show you that at the end again if you're interested in getting those things. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is why is it at this point in history that we introduce a new subject, literally a new topic in the curriculum called variously studies of the future, future studies, strategic foresight, or whatever. And of course, we're all familiar with the unique aspect of our time, our generation, which in fact will be studied by future students and future generations as a time of great change and a time of great complexity. Uh, those are pretty much obvious and uh, we can take those so it is time that we perhaps started giving our students the tools and the mindset to be able to be successful in a world of increasing change and increasing complexity. Here's the increasing change part. Uh, obviously, we're, we know that there have been the adoption of technologies particularly, and sometimes the disruptions of, of political life happen much more rapidly than they did before. Uh, here, the telephone, it took 45 years in the United States, at least, to get 50% of the ho households with telephones, and, and the internet only took 10 years. So you notice how on the left side of this, the adoption curves are fairly flat, and on the right side, the adoption curves are very steep. So we are experiencing accelerating change, and we are preparing our students for a world that is going to be more complicated, in which their decisions will be even more momentous. Uh, computer and information technology is the technology that is transforming the world today and has been doing so for 30 or 40 or so years. But it's not the only technology to do so. Before, tech, before information technology, it was petroleum. Before that, it might have been the railroad or electricity. And before that, it was fossil fuels. So everyone has their time in the sun, so to speak. And after a while, they become part of a new normal. What is the next technology? Well, we don't know. One of the candidates is biotechnology. And this is an enzyme, CRISPR, which allows biologists and, and doctors to actually edit the DNA in the... Uh, in, in the DNA, in the nucleus of the cell. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Uh, how are we going to use this? Is it going to be anyone or is it going to be somewhat controlled? Will, will people be able to hack into the DNA in their garage or in their basement? Or will there only be research scientists and respectable institutions like universities and research centers to use this technology? We don't know. But the rest of this century, while there still is some information technology yet to be explored, I personally believe that biological technologies will provide the students of today with some of the most interesting and yet some of the most challenging aspects of their life. So let me ask you, as we prepare our students for the future as teachers, what is it we really want our students to learn? When they're done with school, when they graduate, what do we want them to walk away with? Well, when you ask teachers this, the list is, uh, is usually pretty, pretty common. The first thing they want is independent thinking. They want people to make decisions for themselves. They want them to be creative and critical in their, in their judgments. They want them to be able to solve problems and communicate the solutions to those problems. They want them to be able to collaborate with others and form teams for learning and for problem solving. Almost every teacher will tell you some version of that list. Well, this happened, I wanna tell you a story about a college in the United States in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee is a city in the northern part of the United States on the banks of, the, of the Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes. And that's, that college was just about to go out of existence in the 1970s. It had served up to that point as a college for sisters for nuns, women who had devoted themselves to the religious life. But in the 1960s and 70s, many of them were leaving their religious orders to become secular. Many of the priests and the seminarians were leaving their orders to do the same thing. 
So Alverno College, since that was their total population, was about to close. The president of the college, however, called the faculty together for a required meeting every other Friday in one semester. And in each Friday, one department had to stand up and answer the question, what is your contribution to the liberal education of women? What is interesting in the answer was pretty much what I just described. They didn't talk about factoring a polynomial equation or understanding the base pairs of DNA or counting the aqueducts of Rome or the hills of Rome, any of those things in history or math or science. What they said is exactly what I just said. They want them to be critical thinkers. They want them to communicate. They want them to work together. The one thing that everybody says this, but Alverno College did one more thing. They actually created a curriculum out of the faculty to teach those things in a very explicit and a very assessed version. Here's a list of the eight, what they call global competencies. And every class in the college has learning objectives for the discipline, for history, for math, science, and they also have learning objectives for one or more of these competencies, and they are assessed on those. So a freshman class and, then, and, the, and coming in will be assessed at fairly elementary levels of social interaction, problem solving, and analysis. But by the time they become seniors, they are adept at being able to do these, these tasks and get high assessments. As a result, they are very much sought after by the businesses and the colleges around that area of the northern parts of the United States. It's an ideal situation for saying, yes, we should be teaching content, but at the same time, we should be teaching skills. We have an organization in the United States called the Partnership for the 21st Century, and they have listed the skills here on the left as things which we should be putting priority on in school. Things like creativity and communication, critical thinking, exactly what I'm talking about. Bloomberg is a business organization in the United States that did a survey of people who are recruiting young people for businesses. And these are the, the lists of the things that they want their new, new hires to have. Communication skills and leadership, motivation and quantitative skills. We're teaching some of that, but most of the time we are teaching the material we're not teaching the skills. Most of the time we're teaching out of the text rather than taking time to back up and let students learn to discover what it is to think critically or what the issue is or analytically. And so we, take, we don't usually take time from the material because we have so much material to cover. We have so much knowledge to, to transmit that it's very hard to find time to really spend time teaching these skills. My claim is that future studies is a perfect platform for teaching these skills. You can teach critical thinking in history or science, and you can teach problem solving in social studies and, and literature. But the problem is in most subjects, there is a text, and it's much easier to teach from the text than it is to teach about the skills. In future studies, conversely, there is no text. It therefore requires a process to think about the future, do research, think creatively and critically about what could happen, make decisions and identify one's values about what they prefer to see happen, and, various, and make steps towards coming up with a better future, empowering them to actually have influence. So future studies is a great way to do that, and therefore I think we should be beginning to think about how to introduce future studies into the schools. So let's ask where students learn to be, uh, to think about the future already, because we certainly do that a lot as students and as adults. I believe there's one class in particular that stands out as the class where we learn mostly how to think about the future, and that's your field in science class. In science class, the future is predictable. It is possible, given the right equations and the right theories and the right boundary conditions, to come up with a prediction of what the experiment is going to provide. In fact, students doing lab experiments get good grades when they fulfill that prediction and they get that result that the theory produces. That's a good thing, and in science it's an excellent thing, and we certainly want to teach students to do that. 
The unfortunate outcome, however, is that it produces an image of the future which may not be completely accurate. It may be that we think of the future as a road or a river, as a windy, perhaps, or even as a roller coaster, a, a way that there is a path to the future. This is the most common image of the future, and therefore we have to uh, take it into account. Is the future really that way? Is our job in trying to understand the future like we do understand the future in a science class to try and predict what the outcome is going to be, where the road leads, where the road ends up? Well, if we had a history class that was um, much differently taught, we would realize that the future is actually not quite so determined, particularly in social science as opposed to physical science. There are a lot of contingencies. There are a lot of things that can go one way or the other. Even one insight into history class would be that the people who created the past, who took actions, didn't really know what the outcomes of those actions were to be. They were just as uncertain about their future as we are about our own. And so teaching history as a series of contingencies, how did this happen? What could have happened instead? rather than a deterministic chain of causes and effects, which seem to be more or less inevitable, supporting the predictability of the future that we got from science class, well, then it was inevitable these things had to happen. Well, of course they didn't. A third source of our understanding of the future comes from a different source, not so much in class, though teachers can be that, but from parents, from priests and ministers, from motivational speakers who encourage us to uh, reach out and inform our lives and take control of our lives. And those are the motivational speakers who tell us that you can be anything you want to be as long as you set goals and as long as you work hard and are committed to achieve them. Well, that's true to some extent, but it's not complete. But that itself carries a metaphor for the future, not a road, not a game of chance, but a blueprint, a plan. And the difference is that this metaphor of the future has us in the driver's seat. We are in creating the future. To that, again, to some extent that's true, but the world doesn't allow us to have everything or do everything that we want. It has a say as well. The problem with all of these metaphors is that all three are quite, quite common and teachers don't know what to do with them. Teachers have, uh, are understandably concerned if they are confused and they don't know how to approach the future. Well, they certainly don't want to introduce that subject or that idea in class because then they will only confuse the, the, the students further. We have a solution to that, however, and that is not to choose any one of these metaphors and any one of these understandings of the future, but rather to choose all three. The future has different types of futures in them, and we should respect each one of them. The first of these is called the expected future. It's the future that would occur if all of the trends continue, if all of the plans that influential stakeholders have made are successful, if all of our assumptions about how the world works turns out to be true. Now, you can think immediately, well, that's not true, but it's a good place to start because it points in a direction. It gives us a platform to start thinking about the future. Do we want that future? Not. What are its implications? Can it, are those challenging? Are those easy? And it gives us a sense that we are using the social science, particularly the scientific principles of trend extrapolation and linear planning, to point to a particular future before we get there. But we know that that future is not, not guaranteed. And most likely, something else is bound to happen instead. So we have another set of futures, not one, but a number of them, that are alternative futures. This could happen, that could happen. And all of this seems pretty obvious, but we don't teach it that way. We don't introduce it that way. The last then type of future is not the future that the world will create for us or for, for our colleagues, but rather it is the preferred future the future that we want to see happen, the future that we can commit to try and create using our time and our talent and our resources. So future studies in, in school should be alerting students to all of these three futures 
and giving them the tools and the mindset to be thinking about their future using these concepts. The mechanisms that produce the future, therefore, are three. First of all, momentum, a physics, an analogy from physics. A body in, in linear velocity will continue in that direction and at that velocity until it's acted upon by a force, Newton's first law. There is a momentum to social affairs, trends continuing like demographic or technological uh, will tend to continue for a while. But then come along disruptions, then come along events like earthquakes or volcanoes or political elections or new technologies or uh, economic depressions, uh, those kinds of things which disrupt those trends and they turn them into another direction. So the future then moves in a direction until it doesn't and we should take into account both of those. But at the third mechanism is that we have a place, we have a way in which we can have an, a say and influence in the future. And that's choice. We can choose to work towards one future or another and therefore not always get what, exactly what we want, but get more of what we want and make a better future as a result. It's hard to keep all of these three things in mind at the same time, but that's the skill that we want to share with our students. And each of these has an excellent pedigree, an ex excellent lineage. It is arrived at using completely different mental thinking skills. The expected future is pure scientific analysis. You could take all the trends and extrapolate them into the future and say, here's the expected future. The alternative future uses, however, a creative imagination in a disciplined way with good reason to believe that the futures we come up with are plausible. They are not just possible, that they could actually happen and that we should take them seriously. And finally, choices are made not on the basis of scientific analysis, but on the basis of values and preferences, the things that we want to see happen. Again, introducing students to all of these three mindsets is part of what we do when we introduce the future. And all of this comes together in a picture, a picture of how we think about the future from the present and extrapolating that future on into the future with the baseline or the expected future. That's not necessarily a straight line, but it is a continuous line. There's no disruptions, there's no surprises, and yet that future has a set of implications which could be challenging. Are we going to, if we headed off in this particular direction and we did that for another 10 or 20 years, what would the world be like? Would we like that? Would we not? What challenges would it provide for us? That's a kind of implications thinking that is important. The alternative futures appear not as a line, but rather as a cone, a cone of expanding plausibilities, the, the limits of plausibility, not just possibility, but plausibility. But there are, of course, an infinite number of points in a cross section of a cone. And the cone becomes larger and those, those number of points increase as time goes on. We can't cover them all, but we can identify what some of the representative ones are from different aspects of the cone and talk about their implications and how, how we will be when, if one of those futures were to occur. And finally, the third mechanism is that we should have a vision, we should have goals, we should actually work to bend the trajectory, let's say, of the baseline or the expected future to some extent towards our, towards our preferred future. So these are all very good ideas. We all, I would hope, agree with them. But what we have not done is yet acted upon them. The genius of the president of Averno College was that not only did she understand what her faculty wanted the students to learn more than just what was in the text, they also, she also implemented a system in the 1970s to bring that about through rigorous curriculum planning, teaching, and the assessment, not just of content material, but of skills. So we should be intentional about teaching the future, not just let these metaphors float around, the metaphor of the road or the metaphor of the game of chance. We should be explicit and have students working through what all those things mean to them, what's going on in the world, and where we might actually end up. So I put together a short list of ideas that I think we should teach the future. Uh, one can teach the skills, one can teach the process, 
And indeed, that's what we do for graduate students at the University of Houston. We teach them to set up a project to do research, what we call scanning, to go out and find information about change and how it's changing the world. We have them do scenarios, and visions, and indeed plans and implementation and actions. That's a process. But I think everyone in the world needs to have a certain understanding of the future, whether or not they can do that process. The analogy that I use is that of accounting. One doesn't have to be an accountant to be literate about one's finances, about the value of saving money, about how much credit will be charged on your credit card for your house, about what things are, how things cost, and, and how the economy plays out and jobs and what jobs can be and what the benefits of society are. So without going to the step-by-step -step process, I put together a short list of statements, propositions, that I'll work through very, very rapidly and let you know that we could use these, I believe, as a set of learning objectives. The first of those is perhaps the most important. And that is that our image of the future as one place, as one time, that our job is to predict, is not the, really the way the future is. It's not a river. It's a river delta with all of the paths and all of the different ways of getting to the sea. We don't know if we're coming down the river in a small boat and the water is flowing strongly or the wind is blowing. We don't know exactly what path we are going to take. We need to try and understand which the paths are, number one, and if we want to take a particular path, we better start paddling early so that we can move against the forces of wind and water uh, that will tend to push us into one path or another. So, so this is the most fundamental concept. The future is many. There's no one special future out there. The future is many, and we should tell our students that. The future comes from two places. The first place is the world, uh, the government, the businesses, the demography, the environment, uh, the biological environment and the physical environment. And all of those things are changing and they are affecting what our job should be. At the same time, we also affect the world through our time and our actions. We affect the world, it changes the world. The world affects us, it changes us. And so we should be always thinking about the future as the, as the result of both changes in the world and changes in ourselves. Now this is an analytical distinction. It's always, it's more like a helix where both of these things are working with and against each other to combine to create a future. But it does, it, 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 it's a valuable distinction because it lets us, first of all, take the world seriously. We can't control everything. And at the same time, it allows us to take ourselves seriously, that we can have some influence, and we indeed should use that influence as we move into the future. There are two kinds of, uh, the two rates of change, uh, the slow rate of change and the fast. The first kind is continuous change. Mathematically, it would be a, a line on a graph that does not have any breaks or disruptions in it. Climate change is that kind of continuous change. The recession we all experienced in 2007, 2008 was just such, was a discontinuous change. And again, we're drawing an analogy from mathematics. There are discontinuous functions. They don't appear very often, but once in a while. We have now a whole bunch of discontinuities that have appeared in social life. Not only the recession, but 9-11, the elections we've experienced, the new technologies that we're, that we're inventing and using all the time. So the future is a combination of the continuous changes and the discontinuous changes. We combine these in a theory what we get, which we got from biological evolution, uh, in which uh, Stephen Jay Gould and, and uh, his colleague published the paper in 1972 about punctuated equilibrium. We go along for a while and then punctuation, boom. And we go on for a while and punctuation, boom. Each of those for a while is an era. We're in an era today. That era began with a disruption and it will end with a disruption. And that would be the, the, the to try and identify not only past eras as we do in history, 
But gee, wouldn't it be nice to talk to students about our own era? And indeed about what students in the future will read about us in their textbooks and what our would be like. And finally, how our era might end. What are the disruptions that could close this, this era and start a brand new one? Statement number four has to do with these disruptions. This is a short list of disruptions that occurred since the 1970s. And each of those disruptions has a very profound effect on the world. It's not just continuous change. It's not just what we can put in a mathematical, quantitative, computer, or econometric model, but there are going to be disruptions yet in the future. One of the interesting problems we have, however, is that we don't know what those disruptions are. And therefore, we do not just talk about them very often because, of course, can't prove, can't even support uh, in any kind of a logical way, this disruption or that disruption. There was an article published uh, in the 2000s in the journal Science called The End of History Illusion. It was called The End of History because they asked people two questions. One question is, describe the past. Of course, people described it as they heard it in history class, full of disruptions. These are the recent ones. So we have the disruptions of of wars and revolutions and technologies and all of those kinds of things. And then they asked them to describe the future. The future, no disruptions, because they didn't know what they would be. And yet they described it only as a series of trends, upward trends like more computers, uh, upward trends like more, more uh, climate change and warmer temperatures, some downward trends, and, and that was the future. But if, if that's really the future, then we have to believe that disruptions have stopped and they have not. So we're gonna solve that problem in a moment and talk about how we do that. So the, the last uh, point of as I made before is that even though the future is many, we are headed in a particular direction and that particular direction is the baseline for the future. Number six here is what might happen instead. And so we think creatively we're using critical thinking. We're saying, yes, that's where we're headed, but we're assuming that the trends continue. We're assuming the plans are the same. And in that sense, we may be on a different path in the future than we expected it to be. I make a big distinction in this last 10 between what's possible and what's plausible. And this is really why, why future studies is not just science fiction, it's not just literary creativity. You can't just write anything you want because some things which are possible are not also plausible. It is possible to be visited by alien civilizations just this week. There's nothing in physics or in any other scientific law that prevents that, but it's not plausible. We don't have any reason to believe that it is about to happen or even could happen in our lifetime. Rather, there are some things which are plausible autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles. We're working very hard on that. And that's been plausible for a long time, 10 or 15 years maybe. The difference is that we have evidence on the plausibility of certain scenarios, certain futures, and we have other, we, we don't have evidence necessarily for just possible futures. This is a somewhat more rigorous way that we would teach students about the future. It's not just making it up. By the same token, we have to use our imagination, but that imagination leads us to go look for signs of change, looks for the signals of what might change and how things might happen. So we're thinking contingently, but we are also thinking with, with evidence and with some degree of empirical foundation for the scenarios and the futures we come up with. And what does that evidence look like? Well, we have a concept called weak signals. A signal, of course, is stands for something else, and a signal in this case is what change could occur in the future. There are strong signals. Strong signals are trends that we have documented uh, over and over again. We have databases full of them. We have organizations in the world that publish them and rely upon them for decision-making. A weak signal is a signal that is not that strong. It's an event. It is actually, uh, or a new piece of information, but it has not changed the future yet. In fact, it may never change the future, but if it does, we will be aware of it. 
So the weak signals are one sign that the future could go in one direction or another direction. And that is uh, what, we do, what we do there. Of course, the analogy here is of a radar screen where we have blips on the radar screen. Some of them are bright and some of them are rather hazy or, or, or uh, foggy. And we may not know whether there's a real signal out there or not. I love this picture of uh, children playing in a creek. Um, this is a park uh, in northern Minnesota, another state in the north central part of the United States. And the name of that creek is a, is a surprise. It's actually the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River, one of the largest watersheds in the world, begins as a little creek. Now, there are lots of creeks in northern Minnesota that don't become Mississippi rivers. Most of them, in fact, don't. But this one does. And so we should be looking for weak signals to realize that we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And yet we're going to pay attention to change. We're going to think creatively about how to think about change and think, think of what those futures are. Item number nine is a very strange analogy, and that is that these are astronauts who are preparing to go into the space station. The University of Houston, where we first founded this program, is right next to the Johnson Space Center, where these astronauts train. They talk about the future a lot. They train in simulators, and they train in problem solving. What if this would happen? What if this were to happen? They're doing exactly the same thing that we're doing at the strategic level when we teach students to think about the future in five or 10 years. But we're not making predictions, and they're not either. Most of the things that they train for didn't, are not going to happen. They don't happen. And if an astronaut should come back from the space station and say, you know, all that training we did was a gigantic waste of time because none of that happened. But they were prepared if it did. So we're not just kind of making multiple predictions. We're not like betting on every horse in the horse race so that we get at least one winner. No, we are an understanding change as it could occur to us. And frankly, even though, just like the astronauts, if none of those bad things happen, we are more prepared and flexible and ready to accept the changes that do happen, which as I said in the, in the first part of this talk, is going even faster and more in more complicated ways than before. So the last is a caution, be careful. <laughs> this is, I love this kid, <laughs> he's, he's, he's doing his best to climb up to the top of that, but what we are engaged in in the future is uh, risky, uh, might even be considered dangerous. And in that sense, we're, we're, we need to uh, get started on thinking about the future. How can we do that? How can we begin the process of thinking about the future? Well, we have uh, uh, documents. We have a library of, uh, of materials, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, we have teacher development workshops. We have student engagement programs, and we have books for students uh, that they can use to be thinking about the future. So the materials we're, we're developing at, uh, at Teach the Future mostly, we're developing materials that teachers can use to teach the future. Here's a picture of the Teach the Future library, a very simple URL there. It has over 60 different modules and people can download those uh, for free at any time that they want. These are lessons or whole courses. They're for elementary, secondary, and college and they cover many, many subjects. It's possible to teach the future in history, in math, and in science, and we certainly hope that people will do so. One of the, the some of the mo most interesting ones uh, are some of these modules. My favorite is the top one uh, on the right-hand side called the next chapter in world history. The next chapter is a project that a history teacher, a 10th uh, grade history teacher put together and had students write and design a textbook chapter on an event that was to happen in 2035 and the book would appear in 2080. So they had to think about a future generation looking back on that event, whether a technology or a political event or economic event, and they had to uh, write the chapter. And they did a marvelous job because they had all the tools and they've seen textbooks a lot. <laughs> they were able to create uh, modules and on the, uh, on the library, there's examples of those. So those are examples of, of uh, history lessons. 
We've got social lessons about values and governance, about systems thinking, and about various specific kinds of uh, futures. This is a whole, the one here is called a whole course on human augmentation, how we might actually enhance ourselves with uh, devices and with techniques for increasing our strength and our stamina, our health, and indeed our intelligence. And so all of these things are going forward. There's games on there, the Sarkar game and the world game, a lot of different ones. So as I said, we have uh, over 60 different sets of materials of different types on the left-hand side and for different subjects on the right-hand side. Then we have workshops. We do a uh, workshop uh, in here in Texas for uh, teachers of the gifted and talented students. And the, the workshop covers the five of the most important skills that we believe are important in the futures, and thinking about the future, futures thinking, of course, uh, the, uh, the types of change, critical systems, and consequential thinking. Uh, but these can be used not just in a futures class. These can be used in a history class or a social science or geography or economics class. And so we, there are workshops available for doing this. And this program that we have, uh, which follows a more or less a process on the left-hand side, basically supports and introduces students to these skills on the right-hand side. So as I said before, we claim that Future Studies is a great platform for introducing students to higher order thinking and 21st century skills. This is the playbook that is written by Katie King and Julia Rose West. Uh, Katie is a graduate of the UH program and yet oh, she's also a seventh grade middle school uh, language arts teacher. And so she, and she was teaching the future when she was a teacher. And the, um, they, they've embedded uh, a lot of futures thinking with games and, and, and activities in this. We use this as a basis of summer camps and also of units in the future. These are the four chapters of that book to define, get ready to, to deal with the future. Number two, to gather information. Number three, to think what if. And number four, to reflect on whether a person wants to go forward. Another book is called What the Foresight. It's really about students' personal futures, not so much the future of the world, but also contains lots of excellent activities for students to be thinking about the future. So we believe that one can teach the future in any of these fields, in, in, in literature, in, in science, in mathematics, and that list there is available for you when you get the, uh, get the URL. So why do we do this? We're very interested in um, empowering students giving them the sense that they can influence the future, engaging them in something interesting, in dealing with complex challenges, developing higher order thinking skills, encouraging collaboration. And we ask teachers to participate with us in something which is new and exciting and with other people who are involved. That's basically what I wanna tell you that it is time, I believe, that we tell students some idea of where we're headed in society and what could happen instead. These students are heading for a field trip. They're ready to go. They've been briefed. They've got their instructions, and they're about to head off into a new future for themselves. The teachers have told them where they're headed, what they expect to happen, and what they're expecting to learn. Here in another group of students who are studying, maybe science, maybe history, but they're not being told where they're headed. They're not being helped to try and figure out the ideas that go forward. And so that's where I'd like to leave you. We should be, as adults, as it's time in history, we, can't, we know how to do this, we can do this, and we should start to do this. It's been my pleasure to talk to you, and obviously would be happy to answer any questions or even uh, discuss these items on email with you uh, after, uh, after we're done. So let me turn it back to you, Olivia, and uh, see where we wanna go from here. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if is there any question for Professor Bishop. Yes, we can translate. No problem. Yeah, okay. 
Very good. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, and uh, thank you for your discussion with us. I would like to ask you about point eight that you discussed uh, the, on the 10 things you, you need to know. You said that the students and young adults should look for weak signals. And that's interesting, but uh, how do we um, teach them how to separate facts and signals? I mean, I'm, I'm worried about uh, overcoming them with too much information, and I don't know how to extrapolate the meaning of each of them. How do you, how do you approach this problem? Over information, over extension about this. Thank you very much. No, I, I really appreciate that question because it strikes at the heart of one of the problems and one of the reasons that we don't teach the future. It is vast. Uh, there is more than any one person or even perhaps any group or organization can possibly comprehend. We have a belief in schools or in society that we have to narrow our focus to the point where we learn everything about something. But in order to learn everything about something, we only have some a certain amount of capacity. As a result, we're, uh, we, we limit ourselves to, uh, the, um, to the idea that uh, we can only know about biology or even microbiology or even you know, some more specialized functions there. If, in fact, the future is a large and complex moving dynamic system, I believe that along with specialization, I'm not criticizing specialization, along with that should be the skills, and there are skills for handling large amounts of information, for being able to find out or identify what the most important aspects of those are. And so I think it, it's important that we um, that, that we begin to learn to teach our students how to handle the large amounts of information. There's a, a very famous um, story, I will say, a very short story, about a gentleman who was looking for his keys, the keys to his car in a dark street under a lamppost. And another gentleman comes along and says, uh, What's, what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking for my keys. I can't find them. He said, well, where were you when you lost them? Well, I was back in the alley, uh, where it's, but it's too dark to look back there. That's really what the problem is. We're not yet, we're not really approaching the problem. You've identified a great problem, too much information, yes. But does that mean we should just then not do anything about it? Or should we figure out how to teach students to handle large amounts of diverse information, to see patterns, to connect the dots, and to draw together conclusions which they can then use to understand the future and indeed to influence it. So I do, I do thank you very much for the question. It really is a tough one, but we should start now. Another question? Thank you for the great talk. Um, in Europe, we're talking a lot about career management skills in the guidance field. I don't know if it's common in US as well, but now we're talking a lot about these skills to build the future. Uh, in terms of career, this could be a, a wonderful framework for these career management skills to be put in. Do you have the same type of structure in US in terms of policies or in terms of practical aspects in, at school? Absolutely. Uh, the term in the US is called career pathways. Uh, I work with a community college, which is the first two years of college for uh, students who are going into more workforce uh, jobs or crafts, not the, not the academic subject so much. And they, a college has 16 different career pathways. So they are going to be accountants or they're going to be salespeople or they're going to be physical, you know, plumbers or welders or cooks or things like that. And my uh, recommendation to them, which I can't say they've, they've accepted yet, is that a student ought to know what the future of those pathway are, pathways are while they're getting into it. 
or even towards the end of it. Here's my future, and here's what this is going to be like. So I agree with you. It, one of the saddest and most disappointing uh, lack of interest in the future that I find myself, and it may be different in Italy, and that is those people who are, who are advising students on their future in school, career counselors and career advisors, are not particularly interested in the future. They basically, at their, by their behavior, though I don't think they would necessarily admit this, by their behavior, they believe that the future is going to be pretty much like the present. And because they don't alert students to the fact that, those, that their, uh, their future could be different, that this career pathway that they're getting involved in has a great life, but there's an alternative future out there in which, frankly, it just goes away. And we know that there are a lot of outsourcing and a lot of automation solutions today in business and in government uh, that basically put many, many careers and even and jobs, of course, at risk. So we should be talking to students and we should be talking to them about that. So, yes, I agree. We should be doing that. And I'm doing everything I can to try and alert them to that fact. I thank you for that question. It's great. Okay, we have another question. Thank you. A quick one. Do you see a link between uh, future studies and uh, um, the fight against crime and youth delinquency? Um, there are a few people, and this is not a subject that I know much about, who believe that hope and some degree of empowerment is one of the antidotes to what many uh, young people believe is a hopeless situation. They feel like their future is already determined for them, that they don't have much say in that. And as I said before, we can't be uh, overly optimistic. You can't have every future you want. But of course, giving up and not trying for a better future is one way of not getting <laughs> that future. As one person once said, if you don't become part of your own future, you'll become part of somebody else's. So empowerment and, and, and student, some degree of student responsibility for their lives, is that going to solve the problem of crime and delinquency? Well, of course not. But I think if our schools were more geared towards some of those skills, we would not find ourselves with large numbers of students in a hopeless, in some cases even a depressive uh, situation. And I do believe that future studies could help with that. Okay. Uh, we thanks again Professor Bishop, Bishop for his uh, interesting uh, talk. I don't know if El Olivia wants to. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Um, Peter, uh, may we say that we will uh, give them the slides? And your yes, of course. That's why. I, here, let me put the uh, let me let me put okay. the the, um, the, the URL back up again. To, okay. Thank you very much again. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Thank you. Yeah, you can go to that URL and, and pick up those slides. Thank you very much. Sure. Just tell everybody where you got them. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Okay. Uh